Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Capipodi and today's presentation is named Power as an Archetype and an Advertisement. Etymologically, power links back to the Latin word posse, which can be trans translated as to be able. Therefore, it implies a type of ability. Translation, transfer, and transformation of the term are processes that have resulted in the term carrying the primitive meaning of it, as well as the evolutionary products of it. Throughout the journey, through the centuries, and between continents and struggles, the power appears to be defined in accordance to one constant axis, life and death, and that's the ability of a person to maintain life and refrain from death. This attitude towards power can be seen as utterly simplistic. Nevertheless, this would, this would be my major axis of defining or rather framing every behavior of a, of a human being. So, referring back to the title, power is both an advertisement and an archetype. An archetype is a Jungian psychoanalytic theory, a primitive mental image that inherited by our earliest human ancestors and expected to be present in the collective unconscious. In the case of power, the archetype of it would reflect the ability of our earliest human ancestors to satisfy their biological needs, life instinct, and avoid danger, animals that could potentially harm them, for instance. That would be the death, death instinct, the awareness of that. The interplay between life and death instincts, in other words, appear to be rooted in merely the physical strength of our earliest human ancestors, since at the course of them satisfying their needs, they were called to use their strength to kill animals in order to feed or protect themselves and their families. Indeed, this is an idea that shapes our collective unconscious to an extent, but the concept of being able has actually expanded over the years. So the challenges of everyday life were the main sources of meaning for the term power. And the Neanderthals were creatures much like us, only stronger. The Neanderthals soon started to create tools, this being the first steps toward, toward technology, as well as a major change in the, meaning of power, in the meaning of power. It no longer reflected the amount of physical strength one had, but the amount of tools one had, and hence the extent to the creativity that they could engage in in order to create those tools. Therefore, power from physical strength, it became a mental game of trying to construct tools or merely just use and control one's power. From Homo Neanderthals to Homo sapiens, the species have been classified as Socius, Faber, and Lundgrens. The Socius part of which was the, the initial inclination for the individuals of the species to stick together, defend the weaker individuals back in the cave house, and strive, strive to lead a form of leadership that from its very primitive stages used to appear as the new wave of power. It entailed communication and guidance skills, which appeared intellectual as opposed to the primitive mental image of power that is presented in the collective unconscious of the people nowadays. With the rise of civilizations, the hegemon would be observed to derive power simply by being associated with the intermediary between heavens and earth. They appear to carry the light from the heavens of whatever type in accordance to the religion that every civilization would follow, and rooted to the hearts and minds of the people they would rule. This divine energy that was extend, expected to shape their thinking and actions was seen as power. At that instance, power was associated with the notions of authority, sovereignty, as well as spiritu spirituality, as opposed to only intellect. In fact, with the primitive distinction between the two major instincts of the human being, life and death instinct, and at the same time the essentiality of spirituality, drawn from the darkness or lightness of the hegemon, became that power that simple citizens would strive towards. Under this circumstances, the new idea of power embraced the definition of violation of such an authority as that of the hegemon, and in essence, it would be used and abused by that person in respect to the position they would be chosen for or would inherit. A death instinct, elaborating on the darkness of the human being, if combined with the conception of spirituality of a hegemon, would be deemed to only mirror an elegant oxymoron 
that would deviate from the simplicity of the archetype and the purity of the forces from the heavens. Power started being treated as an advertisement, as the field of one's work had become a sufficient standard for the capacity, ability of a human being to be evaluated under the illusion of them being an authority. The game of work that had become innate in the space of such a civilization had become the stepping stone for one to possess, impose, and carry power as nothing but an advertisement. This would be facilitated by the position of the person in the society, yet in conjunction, in conjunction with the platonic theory of human beings conceiving the world at its perfect form, and the Aristotelian theory of people pointing out the difference between them in their struggle to recognize, learn, and develop, power in this bureaucratic world had become a prestige, an aura, or a form of confidence. The aforementioned are three elements of power that can set its design within that game of words. I think my, my favorite example of power as an advertisement would be the case of BDSM, so bondage, disciplines, dominance, submission, sadomasochism. Within a trust relationship, two people engage in a dynamic of dominance and submission. The ground rules of the instance fall between the offer of power upon the demand for a, for a leader. The crave for power from the dominant means the need for or merely intrigue towards submission by the submissive. The force is set by the dominant, but it is shaped and cultivated by the submissive. As advertised, the dominant shall control every aspect of the submissive's life, whether merely behind closed doors or in public. Nevertheless, the submissive will set the extent to which the whip will inflict pain. In essence, the submissive is the one that will use the safe words that will be um, will be discussed and agreed upon between the two parties of the relationship and they will have the power to stop the dominant from going further with the infliction of pain. So in essence the submissives shall set the, play, the pace with which they will be freed through the infliction of this pain. The subsimilar is present within the veils of the nature of power, but is distorted when the power user has little control over their actions. So the examples that would deviate from that main rule would be only circumstances of lack of control, the minister's responsibility to use a legal term, and that could be from an example of alcohol being in the picture, and therefore changing the ability of the dominant to control the process of inflicting pain, or the ignorance of the submissive and the willingness to engage in this relationship without acknowledging the fact that they have a sense of certain power to stop the force when it gets overbearing. Last but not least, spirituality and power. That's another form of an advertisement of power. A very frequent phenomenon is that of people who observe a certain deity as power. Similarly, similarly to the case of BDSM, these people turn the superior entity to turn to this superior entity to heal their wounds, solve their souls, and embrace their power. They find a god to give birth to the god inside them. In this instance, if one pictures the emotional aspect of these individuals as the waters of a lake. The complete devotion to an acceptance of that deity and the deity's moralistic rebukes ensures the stability of the lake's waters. The actual moralistic rebukes are presented as prescription for all the mistakes that a person has committed. Also, they are overriding of every other source of evaluation that may have triggered one, an individual suffering, and since this constant doubt of compliance with the various types of evaluation is erased, the said individual is free to develop their skills and full potential towards the light that this deity is expected to project. Since the pieces of evidence we hold regarding this deity are disputable, I shall refrain from expressing an opinion in terms of the actual contribution of that deity and to human beings. Regardless, however, the power of the deity is given given by and received from the individual that has the need to turn to it. This deity is a reflection of the individual. 
This data becomes the battlefield for the voices in the individual's head. The belief that this data exists is enough support for the individual to not lose control or continuously be overwhelmed by their mistakes rather than their successes. So they believe in this deity because the love and understanding associated with it comforts them and fills in the gaps that the, an individual might have. The source of this power is energy starts from one's heart or brain to be reflected on a stimulus that will eventually reflect that power back to them. And since the first link of the reflection from one's brain or heart to that stimulus is almost always completely deleted from the side of the individual or never acknowledged, almost never acknowledged, the individual will be more likely to perceive it mm -hmm. as a power coming from a stim that stimulus they have managed to idolize. When it comes to something ethereal, the blurriness of the actions or inactions of the stimulus enhances the creativity of the individual and their interpretation. As a conclusion, power as a word, archetype, is a type of strength. Over the years, the context within which the strength acquires meaning changed, diminishing the primitive image of strength being simply physical. In fact, physical strength is only powerful if the holder actually can control that strength. In fact, uh, as an advertisement, power is delivered through the need of a submissive towards completion. Born in their mind, reflected on a thing or person, return to their mind. This mere circulation allows the expression of power from anyone that attracts, that attracts a submissive or holds an authoritative position if compared to the one of the submissive, or always according to the perception of the submissive, to actually express that power. In essence, power is like meaning. It is a series of words or in, in actions to fill in the gaps of an image we declared as imperfect in conjunction with the actions one has proceeded in to fix it. So power is energy. Power is force. Power is a nothing that feels like everything.